So for the, the visitors, the program will be, um, we'll give the that talk will be from two until he's done. We'll open it up to uh, questions uh, from the audience. That's an open question period. And then we'll um, ask you all to leave. And we'll have a closed committee meeting with Evan present. Um, then we'll have an even more closed meeting uh, with the committee with Evan absent. We'll invite him back, uh, let him know what, what will happen next. And then we are having a reception down in 118. Um, the opposite end of the building opens up to everybody here if you'd like to come. Um, we'll have some hors d'oeuvres. At 4, if I think the timing will be between 4 and 4.30. We'll be um, ready to come down. And then we'll call it. Dr. Rivera has <laughs> So. Mm. We're waiting a couple more minutes for Richmond. He's messing with that. No, he did. Because he did, she said, I'm going to do it. Yeah. All right, I want to go ahead and um, get started. So I wanted to give a brief interview. Welcome, everybody, to Evan Christensen's uh, master's thesis defense. Uh, he is one of our own. He's the University of the Pacific uh, Biology undergrad. He joined my lab uh, two something years ago uh, after having him in ecology and organismal biology classes sort of thing. Um, we had talked about in the spring before he joined some different kinds of projects that he might do, and I told him about this species of Feria Calypian. I really wanted to interested in doing a phylogeographic project across all of Western North America that had some nice had some interesting potential uh, pitfalls, that sort of thing. But hopefully that was the project that Evan decided to do. And uh, at some point, I think two summers ago, he ended up doing three summers of Field work. Uh, he got in uh, to the program and started this field work right away after his undergrad, which is a really a good benefit. We needed to do that for this project to see how across the sample. Uh, and so I think in the second year, we were in this meadow uh, up in, in El Dorado County, and we were finding totally every meadow of the butterfly that was looking for one of our stereo polypus species. And he says to me, This is much more like what I thought we would be doing. I thought we'd be in voice mountain meadows, you know. Pretty good up in the mountain, sort of uh, style. And in reality, this, this is, is what he um, what he got. Is um, it's a video, but he got really windswept grassy slopes where the foxtails and the birds and everything stick in your socks, and you have to wear uh, leather boots just to get away with that. You can see his neck bending in the wind. It's not as fun of a place as this placid med mountain meadow that he had expected. Um, and then the other thing is that a lot of the times we would be on very rocky, steep slopes that were very hot. This would come out in May and June and July. Very hot, um, in moderate elevation, um, rocky, steep, hard to get up and down. They're called rocky declivities in some of the, the early um, and, and so, you know, We ended up doing a, a lot of field work in more inhospitable uh, places. So. That was a hot one. So we ended up doing um, lots of travel for this this project, and uh, if you do a kind of a rough calculation on this, it was about 15,000 miles of driving to get all of these samples. We had one trip in which we did 6,300 miles from, uh, we ended up sampling in eight uh, states, two countries, we went up to Canada, so we did California, Nevada, Utah, Colorado, Wyoming, Montana, Alberta, Calgary, Washington, Oregon on that trip. We just didn't hit Idaho. And then, of course, we started in California. Sorry, um, So this was on the left. You can see this is Evan's view for a lot of, of those trips. This was my view on a lot of those trips. And fortunately, we didn't have a lot of this. This is one day in Wyoming where we had a rainstorm. We really got lucky that we were able to 
collect butterflies for the project pretty much every single day of that 17-day that trip. Um, another view that I had that was very common was this one. <laughs> I was in the passenger seat. It ended up being more effective for me to enter the data and for him to drive. And so it was his car that we used for that. Um, we took it through a couple of service calls. We got four new tires in Montana. Um, I mentioned the states. Um, several, so they're not off a vehicle. <laughs> several uh, oil changes had changes as well. So um, lots of different fun. Uh, a couple other just fun tidbits. We sample local gas station diversity, regional gas station diversity. So we have some from uh, Montana, Colorado. This is the sunset, uh, Alberta. So I tried to get pictures of all of them, and we kind of ended up forgetting. But there's a lot of, of interesting diversity there. <laughs> um, and then another another fun one is that we didn't just sample butterflies. We also sampled other insect taxa on the trip um, quite extensively. Um, and then we had a beer growing contest on one of these. So here is us at the beginning, um, and here's us at the end. <laughs> I won, <laughs> but he has never stopped. He, this is when he started growing the beer. So maybe there is something to him becoming a man. Or <laughs> anyway, um, so what's neat about this, uh, to come back to Evan a little bit, not the fun, funniness, um, is that we're still smiling at the end of 17 days in close proximity, camping together every night, doing a sample. Um, so it's been really a pleasure to work with him. Um, I feel like he's learned a lot. I've grown as an advisor. Um, I think my second master's student. Um, so you know, it's been a fun project. He's learned a lot. Um, and uh, it's my pleasure to introduce him. Well, thank you, Dr. Hill, very much for that um, rouser introduction. Um, what I'm going to talk to you uh, today, if it shows up on the screen here, is the project that I've been working on with Dr. Hill uh, for the past two years. Uh, it's a project, like you mentioned, that's phylogeographic in nature, uh, and we're studying this species, Spearia calippi, which is from the uh, western North American continent. I just wanted to introduce you all to the concept of the Hill Lab. This is uh, hopefully going to be the new Hill Lab slide for all Hill Lab presentations from now on. We operate at the intersection of ecology and evolution and focus primarily on poorly understood uh, and imperiled butterfly taxa, um, like these two uh, Spearia species uh, or subspecies here, Zerini hippolyta and Spearia calippi calippi. Both of them are uh, listed as endangered. So the genus that I'm going to be talking about today is um, Speyeria. Speyeria was first delimited by Scudder in 1872. It's an entirely Nearctic group restricted to the northern um, regions, and there are 16 recognized species within this group. Um, the interesting thing is that all of them are single brooded. They only have one brood per year, and they all feed exclusively on viola species as larvae. So their host plant as larvae are viola. Uh, those are violets. You can get those as pansies in the, in the, at the store. Uh, you see also that there's a pretty significant amount of morphological variation between these uh, butterfly taxa here. So you have Esedalia and Estiana, those are um, more basal taxa, and they have very different appearances, say, from S. Edwardsi or S. Calippi down here at the bottom. So before we even talk about um, this phylogeographic project, I want to introduce you just a little bit to the concept of species concepts, this idea that there's a way that you define what a species is. Um, and the one that most people are familiar with is the biological species concept. This says that individuals who are part of the same um, interbreeding group, interbreeding population, would all be considered to be the same species. But there are more. The mate recognition species concept is a little bit um, different. That one defines species as individuals who can recognize each other as potential mates. The morphological species concept, which again is different, defines individuals who are morphologically similar but distinct from others as species. And finally, the phylogenetic species concept defines um, species as a tip on a phylogeny. So if you do a phylogeny, you'll see that these, um, these sort of segregate into groups and the smallest set of organisms that have one common ancestor, in this case, would be called a species. So the, um, the, the issue with this is that biologists don't necessarily agree on which one to use. It very much depends on which system you're, you're into or, or what kind of, um, of analyses you subscribe to. And uh, one of the problems is the difference between defining a species as a concept 
and, uh, and uh, diagnosing a species. So defining a species is more, and most people sort of agree on this idea, that all species are separately evolving and they, they represent lineages. So this is one group that is all evolving together, and this is one group that's evolving together. And those two would be separate species. And uh, De Quiero has put it well in his 2007 paper, where he called them separately evolving metapopulation lineages. So lots of populations together evolving separately in um, concert with each other. Um, diagnosis, on the other hand, as opposed to definition, is more of the um, explanation of how you might define what is a lineage. So a diagnosis might be that they're morphologically similar. So diagnoses are based on morphology, monophyly, things like that. So that brings us to the general lineage concept or unified concept of species. This is Tiqueros, this is the guy I just mentioned in 2007, defined species, again, as these lineages, these separate um, evolutionary lineages. And the only criteria for delimiting species in this is that they're evolving independently. Within this, the other species concepts are considered. And I want to point out before I go into this that the order of these does not necessarily matter. But the idea here, here is that the continuum between one species and two species is interspersed with all of these defining moments when things happen, when you have phenotypical differentiation, when you have mate recognition systems that are unique to each lineage, and that this contributes to the separation of the two lineages ultimately into two very definable species. The point that this is, is very um, good for is that in here somewhere where we have one or two species, we're not quite sure yet, there are separate lineages, but they're not quite separate species yet. And that area where there are separate lineages, where the evolutionary divergence is beginning to happen, but hasn't yet turned into speciation, is what we call subspecies. So subspecies is this concept that Ernst Mayer introduced in 1942 while he was studying birds of paradise. That's those really sort of well-ornamented birds in the uh, Asia-Pacific region. And uh, E.O. Wilson summarizes uh, Mayer's concept pretty well when he says that they're considered to be genetically distinct, geographically separate uh, populations that belong to the same species. So again, with that general lineage concept, there are two lineages that are still part of the same species but are diverging um, a little bit. And here's a good example of this. So if you look here, uh, we have Heliconius timoretta timoretta and Heliconius timoretta timorata. So aside from just the names, which can be confusing, you can see here that there's a, an extra sort of cream-colored spot here on the wing on this one and not on this one. So they don't overlap in range. They have that extra little spot, and so they're considered subspecies because they're still, um, they're still part of the same lineage. So the current view on subspecies uh, is that you have to fulfill three characteristics to have a subspecific designation. One, they're allopatric, which means that they have separate uh, home ranges, or that they overlap just slightly in their home range. Two, that they're phenotypically distinct, that there's something you can see that's different about them. And then three, that they exhibit one fixed character state. So when you're catching a butterfly or an organism of this subspecies, every time it has that extra spot. Every time it doesn't have that extra spot. And if that's too confusing, if often they have the spot, sometimes they do, sometimes they don't, sometimes they have a half a spot, then we're getting on more shaky ground. The idea here is that you can evolve uh, species and subspecies through this process, through two different processes, adaptive divergence, which would be diverging uh, with an adaptive purpose, something like uh, Crypsis would be a good example. You're, you're evolving a color pattern that helps you adapt to your environment. And then neutral in, uh, divergence, which has got more just to do with uh, neutral forces, so home range changes, things like that. And then as those two increase, you would eventually get to two species, but in between, you get these two different types of subspecies. Parapatric, where they overlap just a little bit. Allopatric, where they don't overlap at all. So with that, let's introduce the group. So this is Spearia calibi and its home range. Uh, like you can see here, it's distributed across Western North America. And um, it's extremely abundant throughout the range. Uh, so in most places in the range, there are lots and lots of these guys. They're not very rare. Um, why are they interesting? Well, they're interesting because they have a, a phenotypic uh, diversity that we'll explore in just a little bit, but they're extremely diverse phenotypically, and the, the phenotypes are disjunct. They're not necessarily in line with each other. They don't form one sort of nice, long line of diversity. 
There's also, if you want the conservation angle, there's also a, um, an endangered subspecies, which I mentioned earlier, Spayaria calippi calippi, which is found exclusively in the Bay Area, and that one is on the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Endangered Species list. So subspecies are uh, not necessarily as easy as it was the example that I gave you, and this is um, a good example. So the subspecies in Calippi have been uh, contested throughout the ages. There's been this guy Arnold who in the 80s proposed a three subspecies model for Calippi, and then Hammond came back and criticized the methods of that and said that there should be ten subspecies of Calippi at the time. This was in the late 80s, early 90s. And you can maybe see what they're getting at here, right? So these two are subspecies. They're members of the same sub, uh, species, Speria calippi. And this is Speria calippi calippi, the one from the Bay Area that's endangered. And you can see it's got a nice light brown disc. It's got a, um, it's got a nice tan submarginal band, maybe a lot of melanization here towards the inside. And then Comstockeye, which is from the southern Bay Area, which is described as a separate subspecies has a light brown disc, maybe a little bit darker, a clean uh, submarginal band, maybe a little bit darker, uh, black uh, towards, the, towards the center line, maybe a little bit lighter. Right? The, the point here is that the, the, the distinctions that they're making phenotypically are extremely fine. It's not, and this is expanded throughout the whole range. So Speri Calippi, I mentioned that there are three, uh, or that there are three different uh, phenotypic diversities here that you can explore. The brown disc subspecies, the green disc subspecies, and the intermediate disc subspecies. They're distributed uh, throughout the range like so. The brown are found here in California and in southern Oregon. The yellow are found uh, sort of in between the two ranges. And then the green is distributed all throughout the rest of the range here. Um, the, the part that I'm talking about here is just that hind wing disc, just that uh, little brown part here. So for the green subspecies, that would be um, colored green. And you'll see this a little bit later on. The intermediates, I should point out, are not half and half. So it's not that you catch one in that area and it's brown and the next one is green. Green and brown are mixed in the same individual. So these are the 19 subspecies described for this um, species complex. Uh, we have uh, species that are brown, outlined in the brown boxes, uh, mixed, outlined in the yellow boxes, and green, outlined in the green boxes here. And it might be a little difficult to see here, but you can sort of see, if you look at number 17 here, for example, that the disc is not brown, it's green. And if you see this in person, it's actually quite shocking. They're really bright green. The intermediates are sort of green-brown. They have a little bit of green, a little bit of brown. And the brown ones, again, are uh, mostly just brown in the disc with some variation in the, the sharply defined you know, contrast of the colors, things like that. So what are the questions we're asking here? We're asking uh, if we can describe the phylogenetic patterns in Spayaria calippi. Are the uh, described uh, subspecies lineages, are they monophyletic? Who's the closest relative? And what's the approximate age of this group? To explore further the genetic diversity uh, within Calippi, we're going to see if we can figure out if the diversity is structured in certain ways, and how can we statistically explain this variation, this structure, with uh, statistical methods. And finally, um, we want to know if Calippi uh, subspecies evolved in multiple ways, so whether or not um, they follow Hammond's hypothesis, which we'll talk about um, next, where they colonized like waves breaking on a shore in and out uh, multiple times. So what do I mean by this multiple waves hypothesis? Well, Hammond, uh, this guy that defended the 10 subspecies earlier in the talk, he said uh, in his 1990 paper that the patterns of disjunction that we see, so you can see that there are these types that he described from morphological data, that the patterns of disjunction that we see can only be explained or could possibly be explained through multiple waves of colonization. So this idea that um, these uh, individuals here might have been present and then gone extinct and then re it reinvigorated through populations from the north. Um, his theory was based on glacial and inter interglacial periods, so the idea that when a glacier is pushing individuals down a mountain because their host plants are going down trying to pursue their target niche, um, the butterflies would follow. And so their amount of mixing between populations would change as the climate changes. When they're down in the valleys, they're more connected. When they're up on the mountaintops, they're less connected. So how do we go about answering a question like this? Well, as Dr. Hill explained, um, it's, it's pretty difficult. We have to do a lot and lot of sampling to start. 
Uh, we did extensive field sampling throughout the range. We caught something like 1,500 bugs, uh, 1,200 or so of which we used in the analyses. Um, and I want to impress upon you exactly uh, how much work this is. Extraction of PCR, if we catch 1,200 bugs that we're going to use in the analysis, that means we have to extract 1,200 bugs to use in the analysis, which means we have to pestle 1,200 bugs to use in the analysis. We have these little tiny plastic pestles that we crush into microcentrifuge tubes for about a minute or two per individual. So my life, 2,000 or so minutes of my life have been spent crushing insects. <laughs> Um, then we take the sequences from the PCR and we uh, get them sequenced uh, from Sequitec Corporation here in the Bay Area, and then we follow that through into our analyses. This is the distribution, like I mentioned before, of the, uh, the Bay Area Calippi individuals. We have all of the brown disc guys aligned here in California and up in southern Oregon. We have intermediate here, semivirida and, um, and navidensis here down below and the green ones are out in the uh, broader range. So, can we explain these uh, phylogenetic patterns of Calippi? Are they, are they monophyletic? Uh, who's the closest relative? What's the approximate age? So to start, we did a maximum likelihood analysis. Uh, this is done with 1,165 individuals, 781 of which were Calippi individuals, uh, using a, a general time reversible plus gamma invariant sites model a uh, tree was created using mega and 500 bootstrap tests of phylogeny. And uh, what, what you're seeing here is that most of the outgroups uh, line up pretty well. What you're seeing is little numbers on the nodes. Those nodes represent the support uh, for that node, statistical support for that node. Um, so if it's all the way up to one, that would be uh, a very good support. Zero would be a very bad support. And uh, generally, somewhere in the 0.6 range is very good. So um, what you're seeing is that most of the basal nodes are very good. We have our outgroups here, um, our genus, coming out very well together, uh, if paraphyletic. And then we have um, several of our, uh, of our spay area species all coming out as one group, starting here. That entire thing is spay area. And then we have spay area calippi coming out at the top here as a paraphyletic group with a few other species. So the maximum likelihood tree demonstrates that this is a paraphyletic group, that it's not all um, contained in one lineage, that there are interspersed other species inside of that lineage. So if we zoom in on just that, uh, that box up here at the top, what we're looking at is to see if the subspecies within the Calippi lineage are monophyletic. And what we see here is a resounding no. The subspecies are not monophyletic. You see these groups that have decent bootstrap supports, with multiple subspecies combined into one clade. So these are not at all uh, monophyletic. There's some organization, uh, and, and I realize that this is going to be hard to see, I'll demonstrate it more later, with um, color patterns. So some of the brown ones group together a little bit better than the green ones, but they're also paraphyletic for that trait. So it, in general, um, there's not a lot of support for the, um, the subspecies as monophyletic lineages here. So we did a second test of phylogeny here using Bayesian methods. And in this case, we only used 282 individuals. And the reason for that is that this uh, style of phylogeny generation uses uh, multiple replicates. This tree is based on 10 million replicate trees that are then combined into one. And, uh, and if you add lots of uh, individuals, it takes a long time. Um, one of the papers that we read, uh, they ran their trees for three months to get a result. Um, and so we didn't have to run ours that long, but th what you're getting from this tree is uh, node ages. So what we did is we constrained two of the nodes using known ages for the groups from, uh, from Wahlberg's paper in 2009. And uh, those nodes lined up pretty well with the age that we expected them to be. And then that is extrapolated over the rest of the tree to give you node ages for uh, your group that don't have an age yet. And what we see here is this group with Calippi, Edwards Eye, and Iglaeus, that is our uh, target species, that S. Calippi, is at approximately 3.6 million years old. So just to really quickly summarize the results of the phylogenetic analyses here, we do not see good support for the subspecies being monophyletic. Uh, we see that Spayaria Calippi is most closely related to uh, S. Atlantis down here, and uh, right here, S. Atlantis, and Spay Area Calippi clade is approximately 3.6 million years old. 
So moving on to question number two, uh, exploring the genetic diversity within Calypi. How is diversity structured, and can we statistically explain this diversity? Well, what we're going to do here is we're going to base most of our analyses on haplotypes, unique sequences. So what we do is we give uh, all 726 of the Calypi here that we have to a statistical program, uh, which we use called R, and it identifies unique sequences within those. So of the 726 sequences that we gave it, 100 were unique, and those are outputted as haplotypes with numbers. So then we drew haplotype networks uh, with uh, information from R in Illustrator. We uh, generated haplotype distribution networks, combination of Excel, R, and Photoshop. And AMOVA was conducted in Arlequin, and SAMOVA was conducted in the program SAMOVA. And I'll explain what those are in just a little bit. So what this results in is a haplotype map. And typically what you would get if you have a well-behaved species complex with a haplotype map is you would get two major bubbles. Like you could draw a ring around everything. And in between those two things, there's a long line with lots of mutations showing that these two are separate entities. And that is really not what we have. Um, and so essentially what I've done here is I've drawn uh, lines around the groups and colored them by their disk color. The yellow here uh, represents the intermediate, or the, the, the intermediate phenotype with both green and brown. So what we're seeing is that there are, there are signatures of geographic structure. We're seeing some structure with the green ones grouping together and the brown ones grouping together. But what you're seeing is that these lineages are not necessarily uh, grouping as one big group. The geographic structure is just not there. So here is a map of all of the uh, haplotypes uh, under their subspecies designation. So what you're seeing is a, a pie chart with the number of individuals included in that pie chart and the uh, subspecies designation up above it. And inside of this pie, each one of the colors corresponds to one of the haplotypes down below. So everyone that has a green pie has haplotype number two, has unique sequence number two in it. Uh, the only thing I want to point out really quick is that the gray ones are not all the same. Okay, so the fact that lots of people have, or lots of individuals here have gray ones, uh, is that in fact implying that they're different. The gray is private alleles, so those are alleles or haplotypes that are unique only to that subspecies. So when it says semivirida has a pie that is gray and has number seven in it. That means that it has seven unique haplotypes to semivirida in that group. Okay. Um, so what we're seeing again is general trends, right? We're seeing that these down in Southern California all share haplotype one. We're seeing uh, that these all in Northern California all share haplotype twenty, and we're seeing a broad sharing of the red haplotype number fifty-one. Uh, perhaps this this black and white with uh, squares haplotype. So there is some geographical signal, but it's, it's, it's not uh, very clear. And we have these, this green haplotype here, which is distributed almost throughout the entire range. This is a blown up map just of California. So this is just to give you a better idea of what the structure looks like in California. Uh, again, you can see the southern group that all shares that haplotype 1. Down here, you can see a link possibly between Comstocki and Calippi through this um, this haplotype number 30 there, uh, and then you can see the uh, connection up here on top. One thing I want to point out really quick is that the colors don't necessarily have to be close to each other to correspond. So num the blue here is number 26, and the horizontal lines is number 20. So if we go back to the connections, 26 is right here and 20 is right here, and this is a single mutational step between them. So I didn't color code it to make it like really similar, it's just color coded to show um, the difference between the haplotypes, just to make them stand out. So this is, in fact, probably a group, this whole Northern California group, because these are only one mutational step away from this. So can we test this with uh, statistical inference? What we've done here is we've used a uh, molecular technique called ANOVA, it's a statistical technique, um, which is similar to ANOVA from statistics, for those of you who have taken that. It uh, essentially evaluates uh, groups of populations. So if we have all of our populations, of which there are 43. At this point, we've collapsed populations that are within five miles of each other, um, just to reduce the number of populations. We had like 68 down to 43. So uh, what we've done is we've collapsed the populations, and we've eliminated any, um, any individuals 
which have intermediate phenotypes between two subspecies. So not the ones that are green and brown, but ones that look both like Calippi and like Comstaca, for example. So we're down to 712 individuals here. And we thought, okay, well, let's start off easy. Let's just separate the ones that are green and the ones that are brown. So we put everything that's green into one group, everything that's brown into another group, and we found that the variation that was explained by the green and the brown was approximately 7%. The variation that was explained inside of the populations that were in the groups, green and brown, so between all of the populations that had green, was 47%. And then the variation within the populations themselves, so inside of each individual sampling locality, is 45%. What's interesting here is that the fixation index, this FST, which is a measure of how differentiated the populations are, is actually relatively high at 0.54. That's a relatively high value for this number. So it's saying that the variation is not described very well by the groups, but that the groups are actually fairly well differentiated. So uh, we thought, okay, we'll move on to major geography. We'll try major geographical features, Sierra Nevada's Southern Cascade Range. Big features like that that are contiguous are what we're using here as grouping. So everything that appears along the Sierra Nevada Range is one big group. Um, so in this case, what we saw is that the variation explained by the groups went up. It's 18% now. Um, and the among populations within groups, so the among uh, everyone in the Sierra Nevadas, for example, would have 35% of that variation. Within population, goes, uh, is, it should remain more or less the same. And the FST is still high. So then we thought, okay, we'll try the subspecies. Now we have 19 groups. Um, so each one of the subspecies is divided so that we have each locality of each subspecies into its own group. And we find that the variation explained by the groups now is 25%, or just about 25%. The among populations within groups variation is going down, which we expect because we're increasing the number of groups. So we're decreasing, or decrease, yeah, increasing the number of groups, so we're decreasing the number of populations within those groups, so the variation would automatically go down. And then the within population diversity is still fairly high, FST still also high. So we thought, okay, well, let's try a different method. We'll try this other program called SAMOVA. And what SAMOVA does is it applies the same techniques from the previous analysis, but this time it's using the geographic data to structure the groups. So what we give it is the same file that we gave it for the previous analysis without any groupings, and then we tell it, here are the GPSs for all of the sample localities that we went to. And then we also tell it, we want to find two groups. And then it finds two groups that are the best. And so what it's found is that there are two groupings here, and the among group variation described by the groups is 33%, so that's pretty good. Uh, but the FST is still pretty high. And the point that we're trying to make here is that normally what would happen is that you would get a nice parabola, you'd get an upside down V, where um, the best group structure is at the very top of the apex, because that's the one that describes the diversity the best. And so as you, go, as you go up in groups, you get worse description. As you go down in groups, you get worse description. You should find one grouping. That's the best one. We did not find that. We found that the, uh, the FCT, which was this among group uh, explanatory, expl explanation, went up with every number of groups that we tried. Uh, we went all the way up to 42 groups because we had 43 populations, and so you have to have at least one that has two populations in it to have groups at all. Uh, and at first, we were thinking we would stop at uh, 21 because then we'd have the opportunity to have two populations in each group. If you have 43 divided by 2, 21 and a half. And so 21 was what we thought would be where we stopped. But we kept going all the way up to 42, and FCT, that uh, explan explanation between the groups, increased every time. So what did we learn from the haplotype analyses? Well, we learned that these appear, that there appears to be the beginnings of well-behaved groups, right? We can see that when we look at the uh, haplotype networks, when we look at the haplotype maps. We can see that there's sort of the beginning of the groups, but that they're not well resolved enough to, to see statistically. Subspecies, uh, major geographical features, and the phenotypes as groups were not very good descriptors at all. And uh, SAMOVA also fails to resolve the number of groups. That's ideal. Uh, and within population variation is consistently high throughout all of the analyses. 
So moving on to question three, did the Calypis subspecies evolve by multiple waves? So is this multiple wave hypothesis that Hammond proposed a good hypothesis for the evolution of this group? So before we, we go into that, I want to explain a few things that might explain a pattern like this. So um, in the time, in that 4 million years, 3.6 million years since Calypia evolved, uh, a lot of things have happened. Number one, the Sierra Nevada mountain range has risen. So that uh, is created in that time, uh, potentially uh, providing a barrier to gene flow with two outlets, with two ways to maintain gene flow that we can see. The Columbia River Gorge between Oregon and Washington, and then Lassen County, which has a lot of lowlands, um, the volcanic lowlands there. Uh, which might provide a, a way to uh, get genes through. Climatic variation, like I mentioned, uh, has been pretty significant in that time. We've gone up and down glacial and interglacial periods. These uh, corridors, like I mentioned, could provide a passage for gene flow. And then uh, the phylopatric behavior of Calypia, which means that it stays in one place, could also explain why we're seeing so much sequence variation. Uh, in our experience, violets um, are extremely patchy in their distribution, so as you're walking around a hillside, you might encounter a big patch of violets that's several meters long, and there's just all violets in there. And then you move across it, and there's no violets for a mile, and then there's another big patch of violets, something like that. Very, very patchily distributed. And since Spayeria calypi doesn't undergo reproductive diapause, as soon as a female is made and she begins laying eggs, um, they wouldn't have a lot of time to fly to other places to lay those eggs. So gene flow would remain relatively small um, as long as the uh, violets are patchy. We're also seeing a lot of low availability of suitable habitat as a result of invasive grasses and things like that over the last 100 to 150 or so years. Uh, and you can see this especially in the Bay Area where there's extensive suburban development and fire suppression regimes and things like that. So one more thing before we go into this. I want to help you understand po uh, ancestral polymorphism. So this is the idea that when you're an evolving lineage, you start out as one, uh, one lineage, and then eventually you'll split off into two. And these alleles here uh, are going to independently assort into the different uh, lineages. And what happens is, uh, just because of genetic drift or maybe because of selective pressures, you might lose one allele, and so species one is well-behaved. Everyone in species one has only allele A. Species three is well-behaved because they've lost uh, allele A, and they have only allele B. But if you were to go out and sample species, uh, or species two, you might find that some of them, when you do your phylogeny, group with species one because they have allele A, and some of them group with species two because they have allele B, even though they're, um, they're history, their evolutionary history, doesn't group them that way. And so that could potentially be something we're seeing here. So what we see is pretty extensive uh, connection between the populations. Well, um, this is demonstrated in the haplotype network, and I've had a lot more time to look at this than you have. But the idea here is that haplotype 1 is actually fairly well connected to haplotype 20, and that haplotype 26 is well connected to haplotype 20, and so there is connection between these. Okay? There's an established uh, connection in small mutational steps between these different groups. This holds true across the range. There's connection across the range for these guys. And what we see is, is a few very interesting patterns. Number one, that the Eleni, phenot or the Eleni uh, phenotype up here shares a genotype with a few of the uh, Rupestris individuals down south. That's that yellow pie slice. Okay? So those two share, but there's no yellow in between, you'll notice. Um, you'll also notice, if you look carefully at the haplotype network, that these ones are connected to uh, Juba up here in the northern coast range, or excuse me, northern Sierra Nevadas, and that Juba then connects to Semiverida. So the point here is that our, our hypothesis that there are connections between these individuals is probably not very far-fetched. There's connections that we can see now, and so the, the historical gene flow is likely present. So if we go back to this, uh, what we see is that you can look for individual subspecies, like Eleni, that's that yellow slice that I showed you just a little bit ago, and you see that Eleni appears in this group, in this group, in this group, in this group, in this group. So it appears in all of those groups, which implies some history of at least um, large uh, spread, right? So large home range for Eleni, or potentially multiple waves of colonization, right? That you've seen a... Uh, an individual 
or a genotype come down and recolonize multiple times to form these groups. What I can't show you here in this picture very easily is that many, many of these private haplotypes are uh, far on opposite sides. So like if you look for um, uh, Comstockii here, there's Comstockii, and I'm not even going to count the number of mutational steps that it takes you to come down to Comstockii down here. So there are multiple lineages for each one of these, ones of these subspecies. And so that could be uh, support for the multiple wave hypothesis. One of the other things that we think might confound the multiple wave hypothesis as Hammond presented it is that he's using uh, purely morphology to define these individuals. And we, we know that most of the soils up in the Shasta area, for example, are more uh, red-brown than they are down south. And the individuals up there have a more red-orange uh, dorsum and a slightly more red-orange disc. So there could be selective advantages to being a certain color, which would then, of course, confound your ability to use morphology as an effective descriptor of historical patterns of gene flow. The results for this multiple wave section. Uh, the hypothesis is not well supported for similar phenotypes as what we've decided, but there are signatures of historical connectivity. Uh, Juba macaria is not found in the same group. That was one of the ones that he mentioned early on. And uh, Speriaclipialani does appear to be all over the haplotype network. Potential channels for gene flow uh, include uh, the, the two that I mentioned. And during interglacial periods, when again, they would be migrating down the mountains to escape the colder temperatures up high, and during, um, during glacial period, interglacial periods when they would be going back up, there could have been more extensive gene flow than we're seeing currently. The subspecies haplotypes appear in different parts of the map, as well as, uh, just like Eleni does, other ha subspecies haplotypes, like that Comstock that I pointed out, also appears in multiple places in the map. One of the things we think could be driving this is, or one of the things we think is a, is a good uh, signature, is that we see all of these green uh, ones distributed all around, right? So these green ones distributed all around sort of hint at a panmictic population, but at some point in the past, all of these were just mixing as freely as they wanted to, or fairly freely. And then with the rising of the Sierra Nevada mountain range, that gene flow was interrupted, so it could only go through those two channels. And so what we're seeing is we're seeing incomplete lineage sorting, like from that diagram that I showed you, where uh, one individual or one species has multiple alleles, even though its uh, evolutionary history doesn't reflect that. This might be what we're seeing here as well. That these have just not had enough time to, just by genetic drift, get rid of that allele. And so um, they're showing up as fairly similar in our analyses. What are our conclusions from all of this? Well, our conclusions are that there's very little lineage support for the subspecific arrangement that we see right now at the CO1 locus. The haplotypic diversity of Speria calypi seems to peak at local scales and then not improve much after over the broader geographic scales. And the multiple waves hypothesis has some support, but not necessarily with the morphological characters that Hammond used originally. Future directions for the project would include adding more genes to the analysis. So we only use one gene, uh, and it's inherited only maternally, so only mothers pass on this gene to their offspring. And so that could potentially have a pretty big effect on the way that these genes are distributed around the, around the range. Adding more genes would potentially give us a better idea of the true evolutionary history because it's over multiple loci. We can increase the sample density in the gaps, like Dr. Hill mentioned. We didn't have a sample in Idaho. Um, and we could have sampled more densely in some areas. We just didn't have time. As it was, our, our, uh, analysis, or our sampling took a long time. I was sampling up until a month and a half ago. And so um, we, we could increase the sample density in the gaps, specifically in places like Lassen County, which is one of those areas of gene flow. Uh, because we have seen really weird phenotypes there. So it's, it's, it's probable that something's going on. We could also do small-scale comparisons of species-level interaction. So this would be if you're looking for things like, uh, like selective advantages to color patterns. You could go to Shasta and you could look for individuals who all have that red uh, brick sort of color pattern. And if multiple species have that pattern, then maybe there is something there. And we could also look for introgression. So if there is um, in, if there is interbreeding between species, which it has been documented as possible, uh, that spay area uh, species are interfertile, um, that, the, that this could be also confounding our analysis through the introduction of novel alleles from other species. 
I want to uh, just acknowledge the University of the Pacific. I've been here for six years now, and I've been uh, treated very well. Biological sciences, uh, in large part, funded the work that I did, so I really appreciate that. Um, I want to thank uh, Dr. Ajma Rivera. I really appreciate your help. I was, I'm glad to have someone to commiserate about computer problems. And, uh, and I want to thank Dr. Uh, Rishnik as well. Thanks for uh, recognizing my credential as a researcher a long, long time ago when I was working at Dr. Till's lab, or excuse me, at Dr. Uh, Dr. Land's lab, and I got pulled into Rish's lab for a little while uh, and learned to love research from Dr. Rishnik. I want to thank uh, the Masters of Biological Sciences group here. Thanks so much for coming, guys. I really appreciate you coming out. Um, my lab, couldn't thank you guys more. You guys have been a, an absolute joy to work with. And thank you very much for my family for being here today. I really appreciate it. You guys came from really far away. Really quickly, I just want to acknowledge uh, three people who um, have helped me a lot throughout this project. Um, Mr. Indiana Snoot, Dr. Hudam <laughs> Zaman here on the right-hand side in his natural state out in the Costa Rican jungle. Um, and Cassidy Rush also has helped me a lot. Uh, you know, you've been, you've been fun to talk to, and I've put him as well. I can't count the number of times we've laughed together, and, and, I, and I'll probably eat a Subway sandwich for you someday. Um, and I want to thank my girlfriend, uh, Celia. Thank you for being here, and uh, you've really helped me out a lot with uh, staying focused and dedicated to this project. Thank you so much. I also, of course, have to thank uh, Dr. Ryan Hill for being uh, my advisor for the past two years. I know positively, absolutely, 100%, this project could not have happened without your help. Um, you know, every day, and uh, especially in the last couple of weeks, I really appreciate everything that you've done for me. Um, Dr. Hill here, seen in his natural state, out in the campground, uh, pouring over documents um, at 12 o'clock at night. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I really appreciate it. So at this point, I'll take uh, any questions. Hey, guys. The, the one with the phenotypes? Yeah. This one? Or the phenotype one? Oh, all the way back. Defining what a species is? Yeah. This one? Or the one previous? Yeah. Yeah, okay. What's that? Um, like, I the That's a very, very tricky ethical concept to deal with in a thesis presentation. Um, <laughs> I am going to say that I have no comment on that matter. Um, one of the things that's important to know is that subspecies is not necessarily the lowest uh, category that you can define. You can define, um, you can define even lower than that. Uh, it's not recognized by the zoological institutes. Uh, but there is one level lower, and I just, yeah, I, I kind of don't want to touch that one. Yeah. yeah. What's that? Sure, yeah, that's, that's, that's true. There's, there's no, yeah. Right. That's true. Sure. So on the left is the top side, and on the right is the bottom side. It's just a bit, yeah. Yeah. Yes. So the analysis, the genetic that doesn't support the That's based on one It is. So how happy are you with the analysis? Whether to rise to the system, say, forget species, they're wrong. So it's not uncommon to do multiple loci, right? And what we were um, planning on doing for this project was to include microsatellites in the project. Uh, microsatellites are traditionally extremely difficult in, in Lepidoptera. And um, when we did our first uh, sequencing run, we did a, a Roche 454 sequencing run of uh, one of the individuals, or a compound of individuals from the Bay Area. and uh, Normally what happens when you mine for microsatellites like that is you get thousands of loci, microsatellite loci, out of it. We got a uh, hundred or so. Uh, and that could just be uh, because we didn't uh, enrich in certain ways. But the point here is we had plans to include multiple um, loci 
and it, and it didn't work out for us that way. Um, no, I'm not ready to write to the systematists, um, but it is, it is a, a, an interesting pattern that needs to be explored further, like you said, with additional genes and including the morphology. The, the, one of the great things about the um, unified species concept is it allows you to take into account multiple different types of characters um, into defining your species or your subspecies, <laughs> and so including everything, I think, would be much, uh, a much better picture. Um, it has the potential to, but I doubt it's going to change. Um, it, I'm kind of on shaky ground here, but I, I doubt that it's going to change um, that significantly unless the the um, the gene is under uh, selection in some way. That's not a Keep going. Yeah. So one reason for validating subspecies is that if there are valid subspecies, that means if you lose a corner there, you're losing a lot of variation there, but nowhere else is going to be the variation. So then you know, you think about conservation measures for each of these species. So when you say, well, they're not subspecies, then that basically means well if you lose one, you're just losing some individual, but your ability is still found during the population. Uh, is there a genetic scanning if you do an analysis of which corners are the hot spots, which corners are the least important? So there are two things I want to say about that question. Uh, number one, I want to make very clear that we're not trying to eliminate uh, Spayaria calippi, calippi as a subspecies because it's endangered and we just want to be okay with that. That's not what we're trying to do. Um, and this is also not a, a, a taxonomy project, so, so we're not trying to make broad statements about um, exactly how to taxonomically arrange these. We're just saying that at this locus, um, the, the support is not is not present for the current subspecific uh, uh, taxonomy. What uh, to, to to address your point about the sort of hot spots of genetic diversity? Uh, what we saw, and, and I can I can maybe show you this uh, slide that I have here at the end, is that we did an isolation by distance analysis. And uh, normally what you would see with an isolation by distance is you would see that as you go farther away, you get uh, more differentiated. So what you're seeing on the left-hand side here on the y-axis is pairwise FST between the populations that we sampled. And on the x-axis, you're seeing geographic distance. In the center, you're seeing a, a trend line going from, um, from the origin out uh, in a diagonal pattern, and what you see is an R-squared value of negative 1.3, or 1.4. When an R-squared value is negative for a trend line like this, it means that a better explanation for the data would be a horizontal average. So if you drew a line just straight through the data, just like this, that would better explain the data that we have. So the idea that there is um, a way to define like where the subspecies are localized, and then as you get farther away, they're different and then maybe they're hybridizing is, is, is a little bit, um, it's a, I think it's a little bit simplistic for this group. Um, and they do, I mean, there, there is a certain amount of clinal variation. So defining exactly where a subspecies is from is, is pretty difficult. Did that answer your question? Okay, yeah. So you looked at as far as the morphology, uh, disc color, I mean, brown, green, and intermediate. Mm -hmm. Did you look at uh, silver spotty presence or absence of that and see if that allowed more fine still grouping? Maybe uh, green spotted, silver spotted, and brown silver spotted are more closely grouped versus green brown spotted. We didn't look at that specifically. Um, the silver spots are uh, pretty well distributed um, throughout the range. And, uh, and there are certain areas where there are no silver spots and certain areas where there are. And the, the places where that happens has been sort of contested again throughout, um, throughout the, the, the time that these have been studied. Um, essentially, the question I think you're asking here is, is did, we, did we do any more fine-scale morphological analyses? And, and no, we didn't. We did what we were trying to do there uh, with our AMOVAs and SAMOVAs is we said, OK, here are the really obvious differences that we see. And then that didn't really explain the data all that well. And so we went then to, OK, well, what is the optimum number of groups? Like, is there a way to define this optimum number of groups? 
And since there wasn't, uh, we're not convinced that like a morphological character is going to describe it any better. Because, because that, theoretically, with the SAMOVA, should have brought that out, right? At, at our locus, if you look um, at the groups and there was that V and this one was the best one, then in those groups you should see, oh, all of these ones in this group have silver spots. All of these ones in this group are green disk. You should see that um, as, as happening naturally, but we didn't. Yeah? Um, was there a specific reason or advantage in choosing the locus that is in here? So um, CO1 is like a really commonly used locus for this. It's called the mitochondrial barcode region. Um, there was a really big movement in biology uh, several years ago to barcode life, to like identify all of life based on this one gene. It was super variable, and uh, so it would, it would give good signatures for everything on Earth. Um, not quite true, um, but it's, it's the, the reasons why we chose CO1 is because it um, it's mutates quickly, so it, it accumulates mutations fast. It's maternally inherited, so the, um, there isn't mixed inheritance, so you get single lineage inheritance. And then, um, because it doesn't, it's not subject to DNA repair, so that's why it um, it uh, gets it accumulates mutations quickly. Yeah. If you look at certain different loci, are they too similar to be different from loci, are they too similar since they are still substances and these things have been under a long period of time? Two different loci, and they're still similar. Could you refine that a little bit? <laughs> well. um, so since you're looking at this huge time scale, yep. I'm, I'm assuming that a lot has happened, and, but yet they're still the same. So I'm going to refine this really quick. So when I say that it, it um, mutates quickly, yeah. uh, average mutation rates for the CO1 locus is about 1% sequence divergence per million years. Mm -hmm. So um, it's not necessarily going to be super, super divergent. Uh, mutation rates uh, are, um, are high is a, is a very relative statement. So it's very positive. If you did pick CO1, you could pick a, a locus that wasn't different. Yeah, so like if we picked, so, so that's, that's a good point. So if we picked something like um, uh, wingless, which is a nuclear gene, um, that would potentially evolve much more slowly um, because it could be under selection. Um, and uh, that's another reason, incidentally, why we used mitochondrial uh, uh, genes is because mitochondria are in a very high copy number in the cell. And so you don't need very much DNA to make a successful PCR. Um, yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? All right. Thank you very much. Same one, we had open. Because we had, well, you must have not saved it or deleted something. Scroll up to it. Yeah, it's yeah, see, so there's a second question. Are the described substances could be monophyletic lineages? Mm -hmm. And then we had done right after that. We had said maybe it was on another one somewhere. Or it didn't get copied over. Oh, well, that might have happened. It might have not gotten copied. I'll see what happened. Yeah. So I did this one. I drove. I love those pictures. Thanks. Thanks. For <laughs> I know. I gotta get. I haven't I seen some really of those. Neat. The one by the Kia of me camping in the dark would be. I'd love yeah. to have. Oh that. yeah. That's, that's, really neat. that's a good one. It works so hard. I have some of him like that. Well, mine are a lot darker. 
Thanks. Welcome back, Greg. Good to see you. Yeah, how was, how was your vacation? Are you all rested? Uh, yeah, pretty much. Okay. Yeah. Did you get your Mai Tai? Yeah. Did you? No. Oh, okay. Did not. No, I got robbed. I heard. Oh, yeah, that was, that was a bummer. But that was, I mean, good good reason to not answer your emails, right? Yeah, yeah. it wasn't. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, yeah, that's positive. <laughs> that's good. That's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. The weather was good. It was warm. Oh. That's what you went for. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> where, where were you on, Maui? Uh, a lot. Excellent. I should probably stop the uh, live stream here. Oh, yeah. We're still recording the live stream.